Fine. Uh, I'm Barbara Stoa, sir, and I will be chairing this morning's panel, which will address regional implications of the Gulf conflict. It is now my privilege to introduce to you our distinguished panelists. On my immediate left is Dr. Nasir Aruri, who is on the political science faculty of Southern Massachusetts University in North Dartmouth. Very interesting combination of the north-south uh, uh, dynamics, I would say. Dr. Aruri is a native of Jerusalem, Palestine. He's one of the, the, one of the central themes of his many publications has been the Arab-Israeli conflict. Here, his best-known work may be his book entitled Occupation, Israel over pa Palestine. This book is now in its second edition, and it was hailed in Choice magazine as one of the outstanding books of the year of its publication. As for me personally, however, I am especially fond of the poems of Palestinian resistance, which Dr. Aruri collected and edited about 20 years ago uh, under the title Enemy of the Sun. In addition to the Palestine problem, Dr. Aruri's scholarly work has also dealt with Islamic issues, with Lebanon, and with US policy in the Middle East. Dr. Aruri has served on the board of directors of Amnesty International, Middle East Watch, and Marib. He was a founding member of the Association of Arab American University Graduates and served as this association's fourth and 16th president. He's also one of the founders of the Arab Organization of Human Rights. Dr. Nasir Aruri will pre presently address the Palestinian dimension of the Gulf conflict. The title of his presentation is The Gulf Crisis and the Palestinians, Implications and Consequences. In the middle is Dr. Sharif Mardin, who is professor of Islamic studies and chair of the Islamic Studies Department in the School of International Service at the American University in Washington, DC. While Professor Mardin's ancestors hailed from the holy city of Mecca, he, their modern descendant, was born in Istanbul, Turkey. Dr. Mardin pursued his university studies in the United States at Stanford and Johns Hopkins, SAIS. His distinguished teaching career has spanned several continents as he has taught at the universities of Ankara and Boazici in Istanbul, in Turkey, at Columbia, Princeton, UCLA, and Berkeley in the United States, at St. Anthony's College in Oxford, England, and at the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, France. Professor Mardin's research interests have resulted in a large number of publications, mainly in the areas of sociology of religion, political sociology, historical sociology, and the intellectual history of the Ottoman Empire. Dr. Mardin is today the best known and most influential analyst of religion and religious movements in modern and contemporary Turkey. Here, his work, especially on Said Nursi and the Nurjus, likewise on the Naqshbandi order, has provided us with a sophisticated, multi-pronged approach to the problematic of Islamic fundamentalism. Today, Dr. Mardin will speak on regional implications of the Gulf crisis. His paper is entitled, Turkey's Internal Politics and the Issue of the Gulf. And on the far left, Dr. Bernard Reich, who is professor of political science and international affairs at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. At present, he's also chair of his department there. Dr. Reich is a native of Brooklyn, New York. He was educated at the City College of New York and the University of Virginia. Dr. Reich's responsibilities as consultant and lecturer span the globe. Among these responsibilities, and a little closer to home, is his chairmanship of the Middle East Advanced Area Seminar at the Foreign Service Institute of the United States Department of State. In his many and important publications, Dr. Reich has mainly addressed three themes. Firstly, the governments and politics of the Middle East and North Africa. Secondly, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And thirdly, the Middle East policy of the United States of America. In 1989, Dr. Reich published an article entitled The Future Situation in the Persian Gulf Area. This article, however, was published in Japanese, and therefore I was unable to verify his prognosis. 
I need to add that Dr. Reich has traveled the globe at the official invitation of foreign governments and scholarly acad ac academies. In particular, he has been invited to lecture in the Soviet Union, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and Qatar. He was also one of the last official visitors to the German Democratic Republic. Today, Dr. Reich will address the topic of Israel and the Gulf crisis. Each of our panelists will now speak for 30 minutes. Their formal presentations will be concluded by about 11.30. The last half hour of this morning's session then will be devoted to general discussion. And therefore, around 11.30, we will invite your comments and questions addressed to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stauser, and uh, your observation about the north-south dynamic uh, uh, is very interesting. I think that it will probably uh, be dropped from my affiliation because I understand that my university will change its name uh, the next time I speak someplace. It will be called the University of Massachusetts and Dartmouth. So we wouldn't have that uh, uh, geographic designation. I'm going to speak this morning about the impact of the Gulf conflict on the socio-economic uh, life and the political future of the Palestinians. Uh, so it will be in two parts. I will uh, talk about the uh, impact on the economic conditions mainly of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And in the second part, I will talk about the implications for the political future of the Palestinians. Uh, the conflict in the Gulf uh, has had a profound effect on the Palestinian people, uh, their economic and social institutions, uh, relations with Arab uh, uh, countries and with the international community, and on the prospects for realizing their minimal goals. Uh, my paper will examine the social uh, and economic implications uh, uh, for the Palestinian people. It will probe the relationship between uh, these largely negative implications and the political stance of the Palestinian leadership during the impasse and will try to analyze the evolving strategy for the resolution of the Palestine-Israel conflict. The Gulf crisis provided the Israeli government with a natural pretext to clamp down on the Intifada in an atmosphere of near total freedom from international scrutiny. While the attention of the media and international human rights agencies was focused on Kuwait, the US and her Arab partners were handling crisis management to keep the coalition intact and the Israeli peace camp had been neutralized. And so, in these circumstances, new <coughs> draconian measures were applied by Israel in the occupied territories during the Gulf impasse. They were the culmination of a determined and systematic effort, which began in March when Shamir terminated Baker's effort to salvage his own plan, and then he publicly embraced the position of the superhawks, whose solution would render Palestinian nationalism totally irrelevant. From there, the battle against the Intifada, utilizing what they call legal means, as well as the use of force, was the natural course to follow. Under the Gulf cover, Israel would simply embark on the destruction of the achievements of the Intifada over the past three and a half years in the areas of health, education, the economy, as well as to try to uh, do away with the political achievements of the Intifada. Now, I'll talk about the impact uh, uh, of the Gulf crisis on the economic situation in the West Bank, and I will begin with the agricultural sector. Since the inception of the crisis, new restrictions were imposed on Palestinian agriculture, uh, particularly in the area of export of uh, produce uh, to the Gulf. These measures were adopted in time for the olive oil harvest, which was abundant in the 1990 season. Usually, you have an abundant season, and then the next season is not so abundant, and that's how it goes. 
the uh, olive harvest t tends to generate an income of 50 million dollars and it usually far exceeds the requirements of local consumption so it has to be exported another casualty was the citrus fruit export from Gaza which normally nets about 10 million dollars not only did the Israeli authorities ban farm exports to the Arab world but they also began to enforce previous measures adopted early in the Intifada banning Israeli markets to Palestinian produce for example Israeli juice factories uh, bought 55 percent of their production from Gaza in 1989 instead now the authorities began to confiscate enormous amounts inside Israel in 1990 and they even banned trade between the West Bank and Gaza causing perishable seasonal fruits uh, and uh, I mean causing a, a glut of perishable seasonal fruits and vegetables the authorities also declared as you know a 24 hour curfew indefinite blanket curfew on the entire occupied territories starting exactly when the war started and that went on for I believe 37 days in effect what that meant is that 1.7 million Palestinians were being subjected to house arrest approximately approximately 30,000 farm workers were unable to go to their workplace as a result approximately 100,000 dunams of irrigated land in the West Bank was damaged during the first 10 days only of that curfew the West Bank was losing actually 45 million dollars per week during the curfew and Gaza was losing 15 million dollars as a direct result of this blanket curfew coincidentally there was substantial rainfall during the curfew but because of the curfew farmers were unable to plow and sow the seed causing a loss of a whole season of grain and depriving animals from grazing thus virtually denying many farmers their livelihood as to the plains in the Jordan Valley in Tul Karim area and in Gaza the farmers were unable to pick they were unable to market they were unable to spray and the loss was estimated at 4.5 million per week the Palestinian Economic Coordinating and Planning Committee summed up the loss to the agricultural sector which employs 42,000 people and contributes 35 percent of the GDP in a good season this way their statement said that this poses a direct threat to the agricultural infrastructure and its achievements of the past four years the most significant damage in this sector will fall on the sheep and goat breeders and following them the cow breeders then the vegetable farmers especially the small ones and finally the citrus and banana farmers in descending orders so much for agriculture with regard to the industrial sector the industrial sector employs 30,000 workers and it accounts for 15 percent of the GDP it was adversely affected by the same problems which caused enormous damage to the agricultural sector including distribution blockages of both raw materials and finished goods reduced demand and inability to operate due to the restriction on movement even some of the food and medicine factories which received special permits to operate were actually unable to operate because the farms that provided them with milk and other raw materials or the tin factories which provide containers for olive oil were shut down as far as the wage laborers these also constitute an important part of the economy of the West Bank and Gaza by 1990 some 120,000 Palestinian workers were absorbed into the Israeli labor market 
comprising 7% of the total labor force in Israel. They constituted 44% of the construction workers, 17% of the agricultural workers, 6% of the service workers, and 4% of the industrial workers. Those 120,000 people who worked in Israel, plus 170,000 workers in the West Bank and Gaza, have been the most severely hurt by the various restrictions in movements during the Gulf impasse. I'm talking roughly about 280,000 workers. That is just about the total labor force in the area. Unable to work and dependent on daily wages, some of them were actually forced to sell or mortgage what little jewelry they have in order to buy food. The economic minister in Israel, David Megan, estimated that some 60,000 Palestinian workers will lose their jobs under a plan of his that was intended to bring that about, that conclusion. To affect this, the Israeli army issued, began to issue green cards, not like the green cards that we know about here that will give one residence, but these green cards actually tell the Israeli authorities that the holders are security risks and it is near the impossible for them to, to go through uh, 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 checkpoints. So these people were automatically barred from entry into Israel. In fact, many of them were barred from entry into Jerusalem as well. A Palestinian economist, uh, Dr. Abu Shukur, told Time magazine that a total ban on Palestinian labor in Israel would raise unemployment from 20% to 55%. There's no way to give an accurate estimation, but the best estimate that I can get nowadays actually exceeds 55%, something around 60%. You imagine 60% unemployment. Uh, he thought that, 60 per, that, uh, that in Gaza, uh, unemployment would go up from 20% to 60% as well. Uh, Abu Shukur also estimated that about 70% of the West Bank population are considered to be either poor or living under the poverty line. That, that is to say, having a monthly income of approximately $260. So the dependent economy of the occupied territories is almost devoid of any significant absorptive capacity under restrictive occupation policies. It's not as if that they can absorb 60,000 workers overnight who are losing their jobs in Israel. And so these people who lost jobs in Israel and who constitute 20% of all Palestinian workers, they constitute 20% of all Palestinian workers in the West Bank and Gaza. And by the way, to those people who lost their jobs, we must add at least another 25,000 who were forced to leave Kuwait during the Gulf impasse. And so these people were transformed from exporters of money, providing remittances, to becoming a burden on the fragile economy. Uh, the Gulf countries where 700,000 Palestinians lived and worked was a source of grants, remittances, as well as other payments for exported produce. Uh, there was also a negative impact in terms of violation of human rights, bureaucratic harassment, and I'm going to have to skip a lot of what I have in my paper before I also get my pink slip, as Abbas and Nasrawi said yesterday. Uh, there was a good deal of bureaucratic harassment during the, uh, the Intifada. Uh, there was also uh, the health sector and the education sector suffered uh, tremendously. As you know, the universities have been closed for a long time, and they remain to be closed mainly. Uh, those that uh, open up uh, tend to be closed uh, not long after, after that. Uh, patients, uh, particularly women in delivery, uh, heart patients, patients on dialysis have suffered a great deal although it was possible for people to get uh, permits 
in order to take patients to the hospitals. The reason that some people were actually shot and killed because of violation of the curfew inhibited others from going out to seek a permit in order to transport uh, patients uh, into to the, to the hospitals. So in addition to using the curfews, in addition to using the bans and the export restrictions, the layoffs, the closure of educational, social, and charitable institutions to cripple the economy and interrupt the daily lives of people, the army actually used the cover of the Gulf conflict to violate its already disreputable system of justice. The normally quick trials which the Israelis give to Palestinians became even quicker as lawyers were unable to reach their clients due to the travel restrictions. In fact, the occupied territories have been virtually divided into four regions, de facto, de facto. Now, there are four regions, the northern region, the central, the southern, and Gaza. And it seems that movement from one so-called region to another requires permits. The Palestinians in the past would have to have a permit if they wanted to leave the country and go through the bridge or through the airport. Now, many people actually have to have permits in order to leave one district to another. Someone told me that the procedures that are necessary to go from Bethlehem, I mean from Bethlehem to Ramallah, would be similar in the old days to the procedures that it would that would be necessary to secure the permit to go from Bethlehem to Amman, Jordan. So the Gulf War has enabled Israel to make a serious bid for undoing much of the Intifada's accomplishments along the road to self-sufficiency. The draconian measures applied toward that end revealed how vulnerable a community which has not been allowed international protection can really be. Regardless of how vibrant, how resourceful this community has been, the cumulative effect of a prolonged occupation has made its economic, has made its social, cultural institutions so intertwined with and so dependent on Israel that the latter can inflict irreparable damage on the vital structures and render them out of synchronization when the opportunity presents itself. Well, the Gulf conflict afforded that opportunity to the Israelis. Now, just a few words about the Palestinians in Kuwait, because there was a negative implication as well there. And I don't want to dwell on this very much. I'm sure that many of you have read the reports of the violations of human rights in Kuwait as well. And uh, I should also say that Amnesty International yesterday published a four-page uh, uh, statement uh, on that, and uh, the report is really horrendous. Now, uh, the uh, consequences of the Gulf War for the Palestinian community in Kuwait, I think, have been very devastating. Because here, a politically conscious, affluent, and coherent community, which has been an asset to the Palestinian cause at the political, social, and economic levels, has virtually ceased to exist as such. And the cause will be deprived of its political and informational network, and the Intifada will certainly miss its financial support and political support. Along with other Palestinian communities in the Gulf Peninsula region, it will no longer be a pillar which sustains the struggle, at least in the short term, but a fragmented community undergoing dispossession and dispersal for the second time and possibly, in some case, for some people, for the third time. Uh, th this concludes the first part of my presentation on the economic and social. Now, let me talk about the impact of the Gulf impasse and war on the politics of the Palestinians, on the political future of the Palestinian people. So, the Palestinian stance on the events in the Gulf and the post-war conditions have affected international relations, uh, reactions rather, to the Palestinian cause, affected also Arab attitudes towards that cause, as well as affected internal Palestinian uh, politics. A conventional wisdom prevailing now in the West in general, and in the US in particular, 
is that the Palestinians have done their cause irreparable damage by identifying too closely with Iraq. Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, as well as in Jordan, took to the streets to demonstrate their opposition to the US military deployment during the autumn of 1990. They were certainly in tune with much of Arab public opinion, which feared the unstated objectives of US policy, which has been largely achieved, and that is the destruction of Iraq and its elimination as a regional power. All efforts to mediate reached a dead end. The Palestinians were part of these efforts. And when the very concept of an Arab solution, which was pursued, was discarded and discouraged by the Bush administration, which would not accept any settlement that would have left Iraq's military and industrial capability intact. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia refused to accept anything short of a PLO endorsement of the US military deployment as the price for reconciliation. That's exactly what they told Hanil Hassan when he went to see what can be done about it. I should mention here that the leadership of the Intifada published a statement, I mean to those who say that the Palestinians supported the invasion of, of Kuwait, that the statement which was issued on August 15, 1990, by the leadership of the Intifada gave an unequivocal condemnation of the occupation of Kuwait by Iraq, just as it had condemned their own occupation uh, by, by Israel. In practical terms, however, neither the PLO's hopes for mediation nor the Intifada's insistence on a single standard for aggression, territorial acquisition, and the application of UN resolutions would improve Palestinian fortunes in the US political arena. What did count in this arena was the fact that the Palestinians were seen on the wrong side. Well, let me ask whether a more accommodating attitude by the Palestinians, would it have yielded a better result for them? Would it have given a viable remedy for the plight of the Palestinians? The question itself, I should say, wrongly assumes that there had existed diplomatic progress, which now would be abandoned as a form of punishment. The fact is that genuine hopes for peace have not been justified, given that the US has ignored and marginalized Palestinian rights for decades. Whatever the US does with the Arab-Israeli conflict, in the aftermath of the Gulf War will be reflective of shifting regional alignments. It is likely to be consonant with a solidified US-Israeli alliance and restricted by the exigencies of domestic politics, which contributed to the paralysis of US diplomacy in the Middle East during the past 12 years. It will not be in reality, though it may be in appearance, the result of a perceived Palestinian stand on the Gulf controversy. For the US, this is the first opportunity to reshape the strategic balance in the Middle East without the countervailing influence of the Soviet Union and also in the absence of a single Arab power which professes responsibility for mutual deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Israel. As for Israel, this is also the first time since the peace treaty with Egypt in 1979 that a number of Arab states seem ready to conclude peace with it, which is not subject to Palestinian approval, or at least consultation. The actual reality is that the US is now working in tandem with Israel, setting aside any previous pretense for the role of conciliator and mediator. This has become possible during, uh, due to the erosion of official Arab support for the PLO and the right of the Palestinians to self-determination. So the emerging US strategy in the aftermath of the Gulf, it seems to me, is to shift the emphasis away from the Palestinian dimension, 
which characterized previous American plans, such as the Reagan plan of 82, the Schultz plan of 88, as well as the Shamir Mubarak uh, uh, Baker plan, or proposals, excuse me, of 1989. And instead, the US would pursue a so-called two-track solution. Although this has been defined, the two-track, as a simultaneous pursuit of Arab-Israeli and Palestinian-Israeli agreements in parallel negotiating tracks, Shamir has argued that only after Israel has peace with the Arab states will it feel confident enough to discuss the West Bank and Gaza. This, in fact, represents a concession, a concession on the part of Shamir, for which we thank him, from his earlier insistence on Arab recognition of Israel as a precondition for entering peace talks that would ultimately lead to peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians. The second new idea, which seems to come out of the American approach, is the replacement of the International Peace Conference, over which there was a consensus in the world, and uh, a, a, uh, uh, a conference uh, idea that is uh, su supported by the EC and several other countries would be supported by a regional, I mean, replaced by a regional conference hosted by the US and possibly the USSR. Not only will this idea diminish the importance of Resolution 242 and the UN role in a settlement, but Israel has already placed a number of conditions on the new strategy perhaps a dozen or so. Let me just go, go, go over some of these conditions which Israel places on the settlement. One, the Soviet Union must establish full diplomatic relations with Israel and agree to the meeting ground uh, rules demanded by Israel. The Soviet Union should agree to the ground rules that are set by Israel in order to qualify as co-sponsor. These ground rules include Israel's insistence that all that would be discussed at first with the Palestinians is an interim settlement involving autonomy. Final st uh, status talks would begin three years later. Uh, other conditions that any opening statement at the regional conference by the US must refrain from delineating any plan for a settlement. In fact, Secretary of State Baker is already on record that he is opposed to presenting such a plan. You will probably recall that in his uh, five points of 1989, he went out of his way to say that he was not submitting a plan and that he was simply giving a proposal. Other conditions is that in view of the limited purpose of the conference, which would be a one-time event to launch direct negotiations and pave the way for discussing Israel's autonomy plan, participation would be limited to Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza only, and of course Israel does not include Jerusalem in that uh, description, uh, so Jerusalem people will be excluded. Also, any Palestinian who was expelled is excluded, and uh, Palestinians in jail, and there are many of their intellectuals and political leaders in jail, will also be excluded. Further Israeli demands include that the US persuade the Arab states to agree that the regional conference lead immediately to direct negotiations. That the meeting have no power to impose solutions on the parties or to pass judgment or agreements reached in bilateral negotiations. That resolution 242 and 338 do not determine the outcome of the process, which translates into we're not getting out of the territories. And that the US must promise that the PLO would have no role at any point in the process. The US has already promised that, and it seems that many of the Arab uh, members of the so-called uh, coalition uh, have done that as well. In fact, the Gulf crisis seemed to have dealt a crushing blow to the Arab consensus based on the Rabat Conference of 1974. You remember the conference which, uh, in which the Arab states recognized the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. It seems to have dealt a crushing blow to that consensus based on 74 and also based on the resolutions of the Fez plan in 1982. Not only have the Gulf states terminated their funding for the PLO, 
they are also actively seeking an alternative leadership in the occupied territories to negotiate a peace based on the new balance of power in the region. So we seem to be seeing a convergence of interest between the Arab states, Israel, and the United States. This seems to have been crystallized to promote such a leadership. The means to accomplish that goal consist of a package that would include Israeli administrative measures to ease conditions and presumably improve the quality of life, to borrow a phrase from Schultz some time ago. It will also include Saudi petrodollars, and it will have to, to include, of course, American uh, leadership, which translates into coordination. Three-way thing. The deteriorating economic conditions in the occupied territories created by the draconian measures which I've outlined before are counted upon by the three parties, by the Arab states, Israel, and the United States, to be the catalyst that would prod the Palestinians toward their scheme. A US official traveling with Baker recently in the Middle East was rather unsubtle about the utility of Saudi money and Israeli measures when he said the following, and I quote, there are political ways designed to sort of create more of a sense of political support for Palestinians who would be stepping forward. There are financial ways, especially given the level of economic deprivation and difficulties in the territories now. The Gulf War is clearly viewed by Israel and the Zionist movement as a historical juncture that could associate a number of Arab states with its long-standing objective of removing the national rights and grievances of the Palestinian people from the diplomatic agenda. Disqualifying the PLO from the process is calculated to be the first significant step towards achieving that goal. To the extent that a number of Arab states have already adopted that step, and insofar as the US has reiterated its opposition to a Palestinian state, to PLO participation, and to an international peace conference, Israel expects the Palestinian track to be limited to a discussion of the destiny of only one-fourth of the Palestinian people. The future status talks would be limited to less than one-fourth of historic Palestine, which Israel claims anyway. Now that the US has emerged in the post-Cold War as the uncontested superpower in a militarily unipolar world, it seems even more determined than ever to use whatever force necessary to maintain the status quo in its favor. The carnage in Iraq was meant to underscore a determination that American hegemony in the Middle East and Israel's military superiority over all her Arab neighbors combined will not be challenged. Of course, the Arab members of the coalition, which have been integrated more than ever to the structure of US power in the region, have no reason to even try uh, such a challenge in the foreseeable future. But even if they tried, let us say, to try to appease the Arab masses who might be disenchanted with their complicity in the destruction of Iraq, they still lack sufficient leverage with Washington given their increased dependence on the US and Washington's increased tilt towards Israel. The outcome of the Gulf crisis has so radically shifted and altered the balance in the region that it is impossible for the Palestinians to achieve their minimal goals under US diplomatic auspices. The new world order of George Bush does not regard international legality as indivisible, nor does it set a single standard for the application of human rights. His vocal defense of the human rights of the Kuwaiti people, in which he included self-determination, and the restoration of the emir to the throne, uh, will not likely to be matched by a call upon Israel to allow the Palestinians to choose their own representatives, elect their own government, and enjoy self-determination as required by UN resolutions. And yet, there is no alternative to a settlement based on self-determination and the right of people to designate their own representatives if the settlement is indeed going to be uh, enduring and comprehensive. Thank you very much.